In this video, I will remind you of what prime numbers are, and then we will consider a question about them. How many prime numbers are there? To ensure that we're all starting on the same page, let's begin with a definition. A whole number greater than 1 is said to be prime if it can't be factored into a product of two smaller whole numbers. Some examples will show the distinction between primes and non-primes, and will also reveal why anyone cares about primes in the first place. Let's look at the number 42. Can we factor it into a product of two smaller whole numbers? Of course we can. One way is to rewrite it as 2 times 21. The fact that we can rewrite it as a product of smaller numbers means that 42 is not prime. It does not have the special indivisible quality that makes a number prime. But suppose we were to turn our attention to that first factor on the right-hand side, 2. Can we rewrite 2 as a product of two smaller whole numbers? Obviously not. The only whole number smaller than 2 is 1, and 1 times 1 certainly isn't 2. Thus, 2 is a prime number, and I'll acknowledge this by painting it purple. Good. What about the second factor, 21? Well, that one clearly is not prime, since 21 can be rewritten as 3 times 7. After a little reflection, we see that 3 and 7 are themselves both prime, so I'll paint them purple too. And we can go no further, since we've broken 42 up into its prime factors, 2, 3, and 7, which are like the indivisible atoms from which the original number was built. And this is precisely the point. Every whole number greater than 1, that isn't prime itself, can be decomposed into some specific product of primes, much as any molecule can be decomposed into some specific combination of atoms. The primes are thus the basic building blocks of all numbers. Every number greater than 1 is either prime or a product of primes. Let's look at another example of decomposing a number into its prime factors, 360. This number obviously isn't prime. We can write it as 2 times 180. But let's continue. 2 itself is prime, but 180 isn't, because we can rewrite it as 2 times 90. And of course 90 is 2 times 45, and how about 45? We can rewrite it as 5 times 9. That 5 is prime, but 9 can still be broken down further into 3 times 3. And our prime factorization is complete, since we've now broken 360 down entirely into its prime factors. A couple of quick points of housekeeping. We usually write the prime factors in numerical order, so I'll put that 5 at the end. Also, we can tidy this up with some exponent notation, since we have repeated factors of 2 and 3. In place of 2 times 2 times 2, we can write 2 cubed, and in place of 3 times 3, we can write 3 squared, and the result is easier on the eye. 360 breaks down into 3 factors of 2, 2 factors of 3, and 1 factor of 5. And once again, Every number is ultimately built up from some specific collection of prime factors. If the number is large, it might be difficult to find those prime factors, but its prime factorization exists. It's out there somewhere, in the mind of God, as it were. For example, take a moderately large number, 2,349,941,640. This obviously isn't prime. It's divisible by 2, for example. But what does its complete prime factorization look like? It turns out to be this, three factors of two, along with factors of three, five, and two fairly hefty primes, 2,027 and 9,661. It takes some time, exploration, and careful reasoning to convince yourself that those two factors actually are primes. I'm not going to go through that here because we have bigger fish to fry. And there are, moreover, primes that are much bigger than 9,661. In fact, there are primes bigger even than the large number we've just factored. This number, for instance, which is just 7 units larger than our big guy, is itself prime. Incidentally, how would you prove that this number is prime? Well, essentially the same way that you'd prove that 7 is prime. You could just try dividing it by all the numbers smaller than itself. And if it turns out that none of those smaller numbers are factors, then you have verified that the number is prime. It's a tedious process, but anyone could do it, in principle, given enough time and interest. There's nothing intellectually deep about it. That said, the existence of large primes might come as a surprise. After all, it's relatively easy for a small number to be prime, since there aren't many potential factors for it. The only potential factors are the few numbers that are smaller than it. But for a large number to be prime, it would need to be very special. It has to somehow not be a multiple of any of the many numbers that are less than itself. 
You might think that for a number in the billions, a number that therefore has billions of potential factors, surely one of those potential factors would actually turn out to be a factor, thereby making the large number a non-prime. For this reason, large primes would seem to be rare beasts, and in fact, as we travel down the number line, primes become rarer. Some numerical evidence. Of the first 10 numbers, that is, between 1 and 10, the primes are 2, 3, 5, and 7. That's 4 out of 10, so of the first 10 numbers, 40% are prime. Of the first 100 numbers, what percentage are primes? Well, the larger numbers are, the more potential factors they have, so we'd expect this percentage to be lower. And indeed, if we identify all the primes in that range, we find that of the first 100 numbers, only 25% are prime. If we continue past this point and consider the first 1,000 numbers, we find that only 17% are prime. Similarly, of the first million numbers, only 8% are prime, while of the first billion numbers, only 5% are prime. Of the first trillion numbers, just 4% are prime. And this phenomenon continues, with primes growing ever rarer as we go further and further out on the number line. And remember, the number line is infinite. So even after we've gone past a trillion trillions, we really haven't gotten anywhere. There's still infinity to go. This brings us to the central question of this video. Are there infinitely many primes? Or are there only finitely many primes? In which case, they would eventually stop appearing altogether on the number line. Though perhaps only once we've reached some unfathomably distant point on the line. I encourage you to stop the video for a minute and make a conjecture based on your intuitions. Infinitely many primes? Or only finitely many? And why? Okay, did you make your conjecture? Whenever I ask this question in a classroom, someone usually says, well, there are infinitely many numbers, so there must be infinitely many primes, right? Uh, no. Of course there are infinitely many numbers, but that doesn't, in and of itself, imply that there must be infinitely many primes. To emphasize this point, let's embark on a brief digression in which I'll introduce you to another type of number. Consider the number 153. I'm going to do something strange to it. It has three digits, so I'm going to raise each digit to the power of three. Now I will add them up. What do I get? Well, doing the cubing, we get 1 plus 125 plus 27. Add those three numbers up, and we get 153, the very number we started with. How odd! Are there other such numbers? There certainly are. Try 8208. It has four digits, so we'll raise each of them to the fourth power, and then we'll add the results. As you can verify on your own, the net result is 8208, precisely the number with which we started. Numbers that have this peculiar property are called narcissistic numbers. Unlike primes, narcissistic numbers have no structural importance in mathematics. They are just numerical curiosities. Still, curiosities are fun to play with, and we can have some fun hunting for narcissistic numbers, just as we might hunt for primes. Here, for your viewing pleasure, are the first 66 narcissistic numbers. Observe how large they are. Those largest specimens on the screen are already greater than a trillion trillions. So we might be tempted to guess that while the narcissistic numbers are very rare, certainly rarer than primes, there are probably infinitely many of them. After all, there are infinitely many numbers, so there must be infinitely many narcissistic numbers, right? Well, there are still larger narcissistic numbers out there, but it turns out that they do eventually stop appearing on the number line altogether. In fact, it has been proven that this number, which is 39 digits, and whose value is thus greater than 100 trillion trillion trillions, is the largest narcissistic number. Thus, there are only finitely many narcissistic numbers, despite the fact that there are infinitely many numbers. But, begins a reasonable question, how can you know that for sure? Maybe we just haven't found one yet, but tomorrow morning, maybe someone will discover a 100-digit narcissistic number, right? How can we be sure that won't happen? We can be sure because we can give a mathematical proof that such a thing is impossible. I'm not going to present that proof here because this is, after all, just a digression, but I want to get back to our much more important question about primes. Having taken that detour, however, we can now see that our friend's idea doesn't hold water. If the primes do go on forever, it isn't just because the numbers do. To prove that they go on forever, we'd have to construct some sort of irrefutable, logical argument that there must be infinitely many primes. Same story for the other possibility. If it turns out that there are only finitely many primes, we could only be certain of that fact if we can develop an ironclad logical proof of that fact. 
Either way, answering our question will require real intellectual creativity. This isn't at all like showing that some specific gigantic number is prime, since that just requires patience and computing power. In fact, a computer is no help at all when we're up against infinity. If a computer can do arithmetic, say, a million times faster than we can, that's tremendously helpful because it can accomplish finite tasks in one millionth of the time that they would take us. This is great for large but finite tasks, like checking to see if some specific huge number is a prime. Something that would take us a year to do by hand would require only a millionth of a year, which is about 30 seconds to do with a computer. This millionfold increase in speed gets us to the end of our huge but finite task much faster. But if our task is not merely huge, but actually infinite, then speeding up our work rate doesn't get us any closer to the end, for there is no end. If a person and a computer are racing to infinity, the computer will leave the person in the dust, but at the same time the computer will never get any closer to completing the race than the person will. After all, at all times, they both have infinity left to go. Given these considerations, it might seem like there's no way to know for certain whether the primes go on forever. Perhaps we just have to call it an eternal mystery and acknowledge that while God may know the answer, it's simply beyond the capabilities of wretched finite creatures like ourselves to know. Yes, it might seem that way, but in fact I claim that we can settle this question definitively by constructing a simple, remarkable, irrefutable mathematical argument. Can we really conquer the infinite in this way? Well, I will present the argument, and you will see for yourself and decide for yourself. As a preliminary matter, I want to make a simple but crucial observation about the number line. If we take any whole number greater than 1, I'll illustrate this by taking the number 2, and we then consider all its multiples. So in the case of my illustration, that would be all the multiples of 2, i.e. all the even numbers. Then it's obvious that these multiples can never be neighbors on the number line. For example, in our illustration, 16 and 18 are pretty close to one another, but they're still separated by 17, which isn't a multiple of 2. So 16 and 18 are not neighbors on the number line. Of course, there's nothing surprising about this, and obviously this property doesn't depend on our specific choice to look at multiples of 2 for our illustration. After all, if we had looked at multiples of 3 instead, we would have seen the same phenomenon, only more so. The gaps between successive multiples of 3 are larger, and of course the gaps would be larger still if we were to look at multiples of 4, or 5, 6, 7, or whatever. I mention this obvious fact about gaps between multiples because we can draw a non-obvious conclusion from it. We've seen that two neighboring numbers can't both be multiples of 2, or stated another way, neighboring numbers can't have a common factor of 2. But we've also seen that neighboring numbers can't both be multiples of 3, that is, neighboring numbers can't have a common factor of 3. And similarly, neighboring numbers can't have a common factor of 4, or of 5, or 6, or indeed of any number greater than 1. That is, neighboring numbers have no common factors. Well, other than 1, of course, which hardly counts since 1 is a factor, a completely uninteresting factor, of every number. Let's look at some specific numerical instances just to confirm concretely what we have demonstrated in the abstract. Pick any two neighboring numbers, such as 14 and 15. We have just proved that they can't have any common factors. Well, let's see how this plays out with these specific neighbors. If we decompose 14 into its prime factorization, we see that it is 2 times 7. Its neighbor 15, on the other hand, is 3 times 5. And so we've confirmed that these neighbors have no factors in common. Pick another pair of neighbors, say 23 and 24. Well, 23 itself is prime, so its prime factorization is just 23. On the other hand, its neighbor 24 breaks down into 3 factors of 2 and 1 of 3. And so we see our result once again. These neighboring numbers have no common factors, beyond 1 of course. One last example. Take two larger neighbors, 4725 and 4726. The former turns out to be 3 cubed times 5 squared times 7. The latter is 2 times 17 times 139. No common factors. Alright, I've lingered on this simple but non-obvious fact because it will be one of the two keys to the argument that, I claim, will definitively settle the question of whether or not there are infinitely many primes. The second key ingredient is very simple indeed. It's just the statement 
that every number greater than 1 has prime factors, at least 1. This, of course, is obvious from prime factorization. Non-primes have multiple prime factors, while primes have just one, namely themselves. With these two keys, we can now unlock the argument and settle our question once and for all. The argument is necessarily abstract, but I'm going to illustrate it with concrete examples as we go to help you grasp the ideas. So, here we go. For any finite list of primes, even an imagined list, and of course we can imagine lists that are small or incomprehensibly large, we want to consider the prime's product. So to illustrate over in the margins, if our list consists of the primes 2, 5, and 7, then we're going to consider their product, which is 70. Or to give another example, if our list consists of the primes 3, 5, 7, and 11, we'll consider their product, which is 1,155. And of course we could, in principle, do this with any finite list of primes, even if the list consisted of trillions upon trillions of truly enormous primes. Anyway, all the primes on the list are factors of their product. This is obvious. That's how we define the product in the first place. I mention it only because we can use it to deduce something vital for the larger argument. All the primes on the list are factors of their product, hence no prime on the list is a factor of the product's neighbor. This follows directly from our first key fact. Neighboring numbers have no common factors. To see this abstract statement manifested in our illustration at left, where the product was 70, we'll look at one of the product's neighbors, say 71, though 69 would have worked just as well. And of course, precisely as we deduced in our abstract argument, we can verify here that no prime on the list, neither 2, nor 5, nor 7, is a factor of 71, since they are all factors of 70. And the same thing can be seen in our illustration at right, where the product was 1155. The primes on that example list, 3, 5, 7, and 11, are all factors of 1155, but for that very reason, none of them can be factors of the product's neighbor, 1156. And of course, there's nothing special about either of our illustrative examples. This would work for any finite list of primes, thanks to that first key to our argument. So returning to the abstract argument, given any finite list of primes, all the primes on the list are factors of their product, so none of the primes on the list are factors of their product's neighbor. But we know that this neighbor must have prime factors, at least one. This follows from our second key fact. What can we say about the prime factors of the product's neighbor? Its prime factors can't be on our list of primes, because if they were, then they would be common factors of neighbors, which is impossible. So our list is incomplete. That is, whatever else we might say about our abstract finite list of primes, it definitely isn't a complete list of primes, since we've deduced that there must be primes, at least one, that aren't on it. Let's watch this play out in our two concrete examples. On the left example, we know that the product's neighbor, 71, has a prime factorization, as every number greater than 1 does. In fact, 71 itself is prime, so the only new prime factor here, which wasn't on our original list, is 71 itself. Now, of course, no one in their right mind would ever have thought that our tiny list, 2, 5, and 7, constituted a complete list of all the primes. Nor would anyone think that the tiny list on the right was complete either. But just to watch the logical argument flow through this example as well, let's go ahead and note that for that list, the product's neighbor, 1156, has the following prime factorization, two factors of 2 and two factors of 17. Thus, it has two new prime factors, 2 and 17, new in the sense that neither of them was on this example's original list. Thus, we can deduce that the second finite list wasn't the complete list of primes either. Well, of course it wasn't, I hear you cry. But remember, the examples in the margins here are just here to illustrate. They aren't part of the logical argument. The argument is perfectly general and refers abstractly to any finite list of primes. So we haven't just shown that our two specific examples of lists are incomplete. We've shown that any finite list of primes, no matter how large, is necessarily incomplete. Or to put the same idea in slightly different words, we've just proved that no finite list can hold all the primes, which means that the set of all primes must be infinite. And thus we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, there are infinitely many primes.